Great, thanks, Chuck. Um, well, it's it's great to be finally talking about this. Uh, we're going to be talking about a couple efforts that have been going on for quite a while, and I think will be of interest um, to a lot of folks. So excited to be sharing. Um, so quick background, uh, this is talking about two different efforts that are related. One effort is by the National Association of Invasive Plant Councils, and I'll talk in a moment about who that is just to make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, but that effort was to develop best practices for assessing and listing invasive plants. And then the California Invasive Plant Council, as a member of the National Association, we um, were due for an update to our list of invasive plants. And so we, um, we followed the best practices developed by National IPSI um, in, in our inventory update. And we actually took on some new things um, as well, which we'll talk about. So I'm gonna talk about uh, kind of the context for all of this, and then I'm gonna hand the mic over to um, my colleague Mona Robeson to talk about the revision of um, and update of Calypse's uh, list. And then I'll take it back again and talk about the National Invasive Plant Council's best practices. So quickly, who is Calypse? Um, and this is kind of standing in also as a proxy for um, IPSIs across the country, um, invasive plant councils. So we are a state, uh, statewide environmental nonprofit organization, and we've been around over 25 years now. Um, and our goal is to bring together Westerners with research ecologists. And we also are engaged with um, volunteer efforts as well, although that's somewhat secondary to working with the professional land managers. So what we're looking at here, um, we've got state agency folks like the top left, um, CAL FIRE uh, work crew working on Giant Reed, Arundo Donax in a riparian area. Um, clockwise from there is an uh, agricultural biologist from a county um, agricultural commissioner's office sampling uh, plants along a leading edge leading into the Sierra uh, Nevada mountains. Um, and to the right of that is a national, a federal um, employee working for the park service, treating weeds up in Yosemite National Park. Um, on the bottom right, those are Conservation Corps workers um, hired by a water district to work on invasive plants on their lands. Um, in the middle on the bottom is a school group in Southern California working in a wetland. And on the bottom left um, are restoration volunteers uh, working in the San Francisco Bay Area. So that's uh, you know generally the type of mix that an invasive plant council uh, may bring to bear. Folks working on public lands at the local, state, and federal level, um, private lands, and volunteer efforts. So the main things that Calypsi works on are training. So providing an annual conference, um, particular training events, uh, printed materials, online materials, so that land managers can do what they do. Um, we also, in recent years, have taken on the role of working with regional partners to coordinate, collaborate, and plan regional projects, and then secure funding to implement those projects. Um, typically aimed at early eradication. And then we also do advocacy, um, mostly in Sacramento, but a little bit in, in DC as well, in support of sound policy and, and funding for invasive plant management. And the graphic here is a screenshot from an online tool, Cal Weed Mapper, that is used in planning regional projects. It's a um, decision support tool that we've designed um, showing it here in part because it is based on our list of invasive plant species. This basically shows map uh, spatial information distribution across the state for each of the invasive plant species we list. 
So who is the National Association of Mesa Plant Councils? Well, it's groups like ours across the country. Um, there are individual state councils. There are also our regional collaborations like the Midwest Invasive Plant Network or the Southeast Exotic Pest Plant Council. Um, so there are people organized in a majority of the states uh, doing this work. And I guess before moving on from that, I should just mention that the reason that uh, we work in association is to take on projects and goals that are um, of use to all of us. And so this effort towards best practices for assessing, assessing and listing invasive plants was seen as something that we all do and we can all benefit from and there are reasons to move forward together. So invasive plant lists are a primary function of what most if not all state invasive plant councils do and they serve several important purposes. Um, initially and primarily they were there to inform land managers who are making decisions about uh, how to protect their lands, whether they're managing for um, habitat quality or um, wildfire safety or agricultural productivity. What are the impacts of particular plants? What are the, what's the biology of particular plants um, so that you can prioritize what you wanna do um, on your land to meet your goals? Um, in more recent years, an additional uh, purpose has emerged, which is um, to help with horticultural to keep uh, horticulture to keep it from introducing uh, new weeds or continue to introduce uh, existing weeds, and I think there's been a, a growth in awareness within the green industry and within um, natural resource management circles that this is a, an important part of the equation to address prevention. And so, informing landscaping guidelines appropriately requires having good science-based information on what's, which plants are invasive, how, how much, in what sort of circumstances, that type of thing. Um, so to, to form an invasive plant list, um, you're looking at a couple of things. The main thing that IPSES have looked at uh, traditionally is what's, what's currently causing a problem? What do we know is problematic in our wildlands in our state? Um, more recently, we started to look at future risk. We've always looked at future risk a little bit for the, the plants that are already invasive here. Yes, this is invasive now. Is it going to actually get even worse in the future? We've looked at things like that, but this is looking at things that are not invasive yet. They aren't um, causing problems in our state, but we have reason to suspect that they could be a problem in the future. They may already be escaped and um, land managers are noticing them. How can we tell which of those plants are the highest risk for actually becoming a problem in the future? So we'll talk some about that. So as the title makes clear, there, there are two general aspects to this process. One is assessment of each plant and its impacts, its ability to spread, um, how widely distributed it is, those type of things. And that's a primarily a technical task and it uses a criteria system. Um, it's systematic and it categorizes plants as, I mean, at least as invasive or not invasive or not significantly invasive, but usually within invasive, um, there might be several categories like a severe invasive or a not so bad invasive. And the goals for that are to you know, be science-based, to be complete um, in, in a covering all the territory that needs to be covered to be consistent in the analysis of different plants um, and how you categorize them and then to have concurrence uh, between various reviewers and various stakeholders that yes, this, this all makes sense. Um, and then listing is a more procedural task. Um, it has to do with formalizing those assessments, taking those assessments and saying, okay, well, we found that these 20 plants are invasive and and we want you to use that list to do various things. Now, if it's informing land managers who are making decisions about priorities um, when they don't have enough money to do everything and they want to figure out what the most effective things to do are, that's one thing. But if, especially when we start to talk about things like 
uh, we recommend you don't plant this plant anymore. You use these alternatives. That's where um, the procedural part of listing becomes very important and goals like transparency and credibility are, are really important as well to make the list as useful as possible. So Mona's gonna talk more about um, the particulars of our risk assessment, but um, Calypsy has had a list since 1996. Um, we call it the inventory. Uh, the the web, web page URL is listed up here. And it's both, it was printed in 1996, um, but obviously it's, it's changed over time since then. And so we have a, an online database that is kept up to date. And both of those are available online. And it's based on a criteria system, at least it is now since 2006, a specific criteria system that was developed. Um, and that is also posted on the website. So in 2006, so it was really cons consisted of establishing that transparent criteria system and documenting all the decisions. Before that, it was basically a panel of experts um, using their expert knowledge to, to list the plants. So recently at the 20 year mark, um, we undertook this, this most recent update. And so we, we had some backlog of things that needed, of plants that needed to be evaluated using the system we'd always used for evaluation, but we also had this big backlog of plants that were um, knocking on the door, it felt like uh, weren't causing big impacts yet, so it'd be pretty difficult to evaluate them based on impacts, but we wanted to make sure people knew which of those to um, prioritize in terms of which things they paid attention to. Um, so we added a new category for plants um, rated watch plants, which are not technically invasive, but they're ones that are at risk of becoming invasive. And so we want land managers and people making landscaping decisions to know about those. So to talk in more detail about all of this, I'm going to um, pass the mic over to Mona. Um, she's our science program manager and she's responsible um, for completing the inventory update and maintaining the inventory at this point. Um, so I'll advance the slide and uh, you can Tell me when to move on, Mona. Great. Thanks, Doug. Um, hopefully, let me know if you have problems hearing me. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pleased to be helping with this uh, inventory update here in 2017. I, I uh, came on to Calypsi at the beginning of January and worked really hard with our committee and Doug on this update. Um, so the first thing we wanted to show you was our online database. So in the last slide, Doug showed uh, there was a picture of our our document, our paper document we produced in 2006. But we have a lot more um, information now, a lot more plants. We're updating things um, frequently, and so if if you were to go to our website, you would see that we have uh, each species has uh, is in our database. You can scroll down; they're alphabetically arranged. And there were three different areas here we wanted to point out for you. Um, at the top left, you can do some sorting and filtering so that you could, uh, if you were looking for, for instance, only coastal species that we had listed in California, you could uh, do that that way. Um, and then secondly, we have in the middle for each of the plants. Now, we don't have this for our 10 newest species yet, but we will have eventually um, the path is the plant assessment form. We'll go into that more in a few minutes. Uh, some of the uh, plants have a plant profile, which gives you links to things that, that we had in our newsletter, in our symposiums, uh, past symposiums, um, and other information that we have available on these plants. Uh, Cowweed Mapper, that would link you to a map of the species, and Doug showed you a screenshot of that interface and some of the plants have species ID cards not all of them but that's also available if you're interested and then to the right of that we have the different ratings so there are three different uh, category ratings that we have uh, limited moderate and high and then to the right of that the alert status is for weeds with high impact and low distribution um, so that's what our online database 
looks like. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, so I talked about the PATH, which stands for Plant Assessment Form. And this is, as Doug was talking about, the transparent criteria of how we list a uh, plant uh, in our inventory. Um, you can see that there's three different sections and uh, 13 criteria in this list. Uh, we have several questions on the impact of the plant. We have several more questions on the invasiveness and two questions on the distribution of the plant. So this is how we document um, our, our finding and justify our rankings of the different species. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you'll see, okay, so this is the criteria and we're just pulling out for the first question how um, the criteria is based. Um, so the, the folks who do the plan assessment forms go through each of these questions and uh, do an evaluation based on the information we have available. So one thing I wanted to point out is this is just one of those 13 questions. This is all available on our website. We have a, a PDF document we produced back in 2003 that lines all of this stuff out. So those of you who would want to follow our system, you could just go and look up all of this information. Uh, next slide, please. And as part of, uh, and also for each um, of the criteria questions, we provide documentation. So sometimes we have peer-reviewed literature, which we're really happy about. Sometimes we have uh, gray literature. Uh, Oftentimes we have a lot of observational information. Here we have one person cited who we talked to or emailed with and we keep all that documentation so that people who are interested can take a look at that if, they're, if they want to do that. But I think this is a really strong part of our uh, system in that we have all of this stuff transparently up there for people to look at. Next slide, please. Uh, also, when we do the listing of a particular species, we keep track of who was on the committee. Uh, we keep track of when the committee review was done, when it was evaluated, um, any general comments we may have so that we can track back. Um, you know, I did some updating of the taxonomy, for instance, from 2006. We had a major revision in California of our flora, and so we needed to fix those old names and put them in the new names. So when I do that kind of thing, I put in the comments, you know, hey, the name was updated here. And we do maintain synonymy too. So you can see we have the most recent taxonomy and we have a synonym just to help people figure out which plant we're talking about. Uh, next slide, please. So Doug uh, started to touch on the new watch plant category. So uh, previously, in 2006, we only used the plant assessment form to rank species. Um, and in uh, 2016, last year, we started working on a new category uh, using a predictive tool developed by UC Davis and University of Washington that was, that was developed to help nurseries avoid risky plant introductions. So we decided to get that, uh, to learn how to use that tool ourselves and uh, go through um, a list of species that we uh, had gathered from land managers and others. Uh, we get emails all the time. People say, uh, hey, what about uh, yellow glandweed, Parenticellia viscosa? I think that's behaving invasively in my area. Here's some documentation. And so what I do is I gather all of those uh, suggestions and my predecessor also did this, and we had quite a long list of plants that people thought we should put in our inventory. So um, we we decided, okay, we could take a subset of those plants. We kind of, uh, you know, we decided which might might be the most useful to look at first, and uh, we did close uh, assessment of close to 200 of those plants to see if they could uh, potentially be either in the watch category or in our list. So if you go to the next slide, we use this predictive tool. And the predictive tool has 20 questions. And it, after you run each species through the 20 questions, it puts them in a category, either low risk of invasiveness, evaluate further, 
or high risk of invasiveness. And those 20 questions are similar to what we use in our same. They're um, uh, and they're they're gathered into four different areas. There's questions about the invasive history and climate matching, questions about impacts on native plants and animals, questions about the plant's reproductive strategies, and questions about dispersal. And this is a it's a great tool because uh, it's based on work that was done previously um, in Australia, and uh, it's it's. Basically, we, it's been tested. You know, it's been scientifically tested. So what they they have looked at uh, how it works for known invasive plants and whether it predicts it correctly. So it's it's a great tool, and we used it on on our plants, and we found it to be pretty pretty helpful. So if you go to the next slide, one of the important things uh, in oh, and here here's a picture of some of the different. Uh, questions that are in the predictive assessment. So you can just get an idea. Uh, we wanted to say, has the species become naturalized where it is not native? And has the species been noted as being naturalized in the United States or the world in a similar climate? So uh, so those are what the questions look like. And this uh, predictive tool also includes references. So people can track back and see how the assessments were made. So now I want to go to the next tool that talks about the climate matching. And one outgrowth of this whole uh, process was that we have this great uh, tool that, that's been developed that's at the URL you can see there on the slide um, that's available to use that uh, integrates uh, different uh, layers. So we use an approach that was uh, used by USD AFIT, similar to theirs in their assessments. It combines ecozones, hardiness zones, and precipitation bands. Um, so the way it works is you choose an area in the United States. So uh, here we've chosen Missouri, and it, based on the, those three types of climate layers that occur in Missouri, uh, it will predict for you where else in the world has a similar climate. So we, the next shot shows you where that would be in Europe. So, uh, so you can see it's it's not um, you know it's it's pretty good. It's not it doesn't show all of Europe. It shows places with um, climate matches in those particular areas. And then the next shot is uh, showing Asia. So the way we use this in the predictive assessment was we would start with California because that's because uh, the predictive assessment you have to choose the area of interest. We started with California, then we would look at a particular plant we were screening, look at its native range, see if uh, if any. So look at its native range and where it where it's naturalized. Does that match with California? Then another question looked at only where that plant has become invasive in the world that's documented as being invasive, does that match any climate in California? So that gave us a good idea of how, uh, you know, then we, could do, then we could score those questions in the predictive assessment and say, yes, it does have a match with California, or no, it doesn't, and that, that would contribute to its score. Next slide, please. So we uh, there's 1,800 non-native plant species in California, and so we chose uh, 200 species from that that list of suggestions that we compiled over the years. So we we chose some of those, we ran them through the 20 question assessments, and we found that 86 plants, or 44 percent of the ones that we screened, were high risk, uh, potentially invasive. And so then those are the plants that have uh, that we are calling watch plants now in our inventory, and so the and so uh, yeah, so that's that's what we did with the predictive assessment. Uh, next slide, please. So here's how we'll be depicting those new watch plants and our other inventory plants that we've assessed with the path. So so once again, the the difference between these two categories is that. The plants that we consider invasive in California already that we would that we assessed with the path and it showed that it was uh, 
becoming invasive in wild ones uh, would either be scored as high, moderate, or limited using the path. Those other plants, those 200 plants we assessed, the uh, around 80 plants that became watch plants have not yet demonstrated that they are escaping into wildlands in California and causing impacts. But some of those species we screened, those are that we'll be doing those in our next round of uh, of path assessments because some of them uh, we weren't weren't known to be invasive already in California. We didn't have enough data. So that's what I've really been asking people who say, hey, you need, you need to list this plant. I'm like, well, I need information, I need documentation that it's escaping into wild ones here in California and causing impacts. Um, so in addition to those two, uh, those two categories uh, that we'll be showing on our website in that um, database format type of thing that I showed you previously, we have the pending assessment category. And that's the holding place. Those are the nominations that people send us. Um, but that haven't been assessed yet. Then we also have a list that that has been assessed, but they weren't shown to be causing impacts in California. Uh, they weren't shown, we don't have enough, or maybe we don't have an information, enough information, but we have done an assessment. So we have a number of plants in that category. And then a new thing that we'll be trying that we hope will be useful to people is to have this trending topics, uh, you know, category over here, maybe five to ten key plants, um, we see that as maybe we, we're always having new introductions of plants into California. Now, somebody discovers something new, uh, we want a way to kind of flag that for people, say, hey, keep a lookout for this. Or if there's a plant that maybe has been, um, you know, in California a long time but is just starting to expand exponentially, we want to highlight some of those. So. Uh, that's something that we'll be doing in the future. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, when we do a plant assessment uh, form, when we decide that we want to figure out if something is worthy of being in the inventory, uh, we prepare the PAS, the plant assessment form that I've been talking about already. So it's drafted by one person, it's reviewed by a subcommittee, and then it's approved by the full committee. And uh, this, the, uh, the subcommittee and the full committee are really important groups of local experts who have a broad knowledge of invasive plants uh, in their area and hopefully throughout the state. Um, and so what, what happens is uh, after we prepare that, it goes through the committee's approval. The committee says, yes, this draft is in our opinion, ready to go out to public comment, uh, we have a public comment period now. Um, and we didn't do that before. So this is the first year uh, that we have tried that process. And I'll talk to you a bit more in a few minutes about how that went. Um, but we think it was a very valuable process. Um, uh, next slide, please. So we had 18 experts on our committee from um, areas. And you can see we had government agencies, we have uh, nonprofits, we had some local uh, local agency type folks, Botanic Gardens, the Nature Conservancy, uh, University of California Co and Cooperative Extension, uh, and some nurse, one person from nursery industry uh, who was really interested in um, invasive plants and native plant distribution. So. We saw it as really important to have a, a wide variety of experts participating, um, and we wanted uh, to have more than just agency staff and environmentalists on the committee. So we were happy to get the botanic gardens and the nursery industry representative so that uh, we could have some engagement from the horticultural community, and we're hoping to increase that in our next, next round of assessment. Uh, next slide, please. So, as I said, we just started with the public comment uh, this year. That's our, it's our first time that, that we had done that formally. Um, and we prepared all of our, uh, we had our 10 
new plants to add to the inventory, and then we had 80, uh, around 80 plants that that watch plant category. Um, so we posted those with a 60-day public comment period, and we had planned to have another 30-day comment period as needed. Um, and we posted those on our website, and people responded through email. We did get one letter through the regular postal service. Um, and one thing that we want to try to do differently in the future is our review process was in uh, the spring, which was not a great time for nursery industry um, partners to participate. So uh, in, the, in the future, we hope to move our review time more to the winter, but also to try to engage them earlier in the process, um, perhaps just at, at the time when we're picking plants to run through the assessment, if they could even look at those at the beginning and see whether they were interested in them, then, then we could uh, get their feedback later on in the process a little more easily. Um, so we were looking for technical comments about the assessments, and we did get some of those. Um, and, uh, but we got lots of comments expressing concern over our work in general. And I'll share some of that on the next slide. Um, but we got, we got about 25 comments. And um, and if we, what our plan was, was we thought, okay, we have our drafts posted. If someone provides us information that indicates that we should change one of the categories of the path from, you know, say we said it should be listed as moderate and they thought there was more information that should have been changed to the high category, um, or, you know, then we would have put those plants uh, out for another 30 days. They basically would have received the comments, incorporated the comments, and then did another public review process. But that didn't really happen. Most of the technical comments we received, they were, they were pretty much just um, small details or perhaps adding additional distribution information, but not enough that it would change the overall assessment. Like maybe they said, oh, you said it was in Butte County, and I've also seen it in Tehama County, or something like that. So it wasn't a major increase in knowledge that would have changed the assessment. And so therefore, we didn't do the second round of public review. But we had um, incorporated that in our timelines, so we were ready to do that if it was needed. Uh, and perhaps in the future, we'll need to do that. Uh, next slide, please. So some of our uh, comments, uh, perspective comments, um, as, as we've couched this, were basically about, you know, just the study of invasive plants in general, whether this is uh, a useful thing for us to spend our energy on, um, you know, that by pointing out which plants are invasive, we are decreasing the value of natives in some way, that we are biased against um, non-natives, uh, that uh, you know that we were supporting the use of chemicals, um, all just all kinds of things like that that really weren't uh, pertinent to the listing process. So, um, but but we see this as a really good opportunity to dialogue with these folks about why we're even here, what are we doing, um, why does calepsy even exist, and hey, here's some of the things we do that are really useful, you know, such as hey, we're we're helping protect uh, native biodiversity through information about invasive plants. So, you know, there are uh, several groups, and, and since we're headquartered in California, the Bay Area, um, there are groups that are very concerned in that area about herbicide use and about eucalyptus removal. So those groups got a hold of our request for comments and circulated it around in their organization. So we got several sets of duplicative comments, you know, this basically the very same comment, but the words changed a little bit. So um, we had a few of those, uh, and uh, uh, basically all of the comments, um, we made them anonymous. We didn't give out the commenters' contact information, but we, we kind of uh, clumped them together and pulled out the, um, the similar information and responded to it, um, it kind of as a group, 
you know, so if, if there, for instance, if there was a comment that said, uh, you know, you should, you're, you're saying that all non-natives are bad, we'd say, no, we're, we're focusing on invasives. Uh, we realize that there are non-native plants that aren't causing harm to the environment. And so, you know, that type of thing. So we, so if you look on our website, we have a list of all the comments we received and we have a response document that keys, each comment has a key that says, you know, see response number two. And then you go to the Word document and there's some detailed information on that. And of course, on the technical comments, we did, re we responded to those specifically and we said, yes, uh, we've incorporated your information in this part of our assessment. So people could see, um, okay, you received my comment, I made some change, and if it was a philosophical comment, then they could say, well, in generally, in general, here's our philosophy, but there really wasn't anything that we need, we could really change in our assessment to address those types of comments. Um, so, uh, so the document we have posted, we want to encourage people to look at it because it could serve as a good start for um, for a frequently asked question type of posting uh, that National EPSI has talked about putting together to address these kinds of concerns in the future. So um, once again, I just want to say how important it was for us to have a really engaged committee uh, of technical support people to um, help us with this because uh, I, I just uh, I can't say how great it was, those perspectives, and they had a lot of information and um, really helped us produce strong assessments. And um, now I think that's all I have to say on that, and I'm going to pass it back to Doug. All right. Uh, thanks, Mona. Um, that's a lot of slides with words, so here's one with pictures um, before more slides with words. Um, and just to give you a sense for the the major rating categories we have. Um, through the traditional plant assessment form, we have high, moderate, and limited. So here's an example of a plant that is rated high, um, yellow star thistle, probably uh, our state weed, if we were to have one, covers 14 million acres of rangeland. Um, a moderate tree of heaven, um, which is found over a lot of states. A limited um, and a new species, Volutaria tubuliflora, um, and that grows down in the desert and it actually has an alert status on it because it does seem to be spreading, spreading quickly and of limited distribution. Um, and then on the new watch list, um, shiny geranium is a plant where it's showed up in California. We know it's been a problem elsewhere, but it's not necessarily having an impact here yet. So we want it to be on people's radar screens. So moving on to what the National Association of Invasive Plant Councils has done, um, we started a process several years ago actually working through ASTM, which is a, a, a standards organization, and um, worked on that for a while and then ended up kind of jumping that and doing something different, which is uh, publishing a simplified version ourselves and also um, passing some stuff on to APHIS who is working on a, a more formal version. Um, but basically we compiled existing approaches to assessing and listing invasive plants and we looked for the things they had in common and anything that looked like a, a strong feature maybe that, that one system would have and putting those together into a, a, a standard or a best practices document. And through the process, especially through ASTM, um, there was lots of discussion with concerned industry representatives. And that's, that's in part why we left ASTM is because there was enough concern that, they, um, that the process really wasn't going anywhere. Um, but through that engagement with uh, all the various concerns and kind of like the comments we received on our Calypsi update, some of them were technical and some of them were more perspectives based, um, but from a different angle. Um, we, we learned a lot about what could help build transparency and credibility. And so I think that that was a key part of the process and helped a lot. Um, so again, there are those two parts. There's the assessment methodology, the, the technical criteria-based part, and there's the procedural process um, type part. 
And so for the assessment methodology on the National IPSI checklist, um, there's a list of factors that need to be considered. Um, and so that's kind of the content of criteria. And we'll talk about that next. Um, there's scoring and categor categorization. So you um, need to have some sort of a system. Um, and then there's documentation or the, the requirement that there be documentation. And in terms of process, there's guidelines for planning the process and for drafting the assessments, getting the assessments reviewed by a committee and by the public, and then finalizing and posting. So in terms of the methodology, the, the basic content falls into these categories. And each of these categories or factors has two to six subcategories. So it's bro it, it gets pretty fine grained, um, but this is the overview. So that could be in a, in a risk assessment for invasive plants. Information about the plant's distribution, about its reproductive capacity, about its ability to establish and spread both with and without disturbance, um, impacts on the environment that um, are abiotic, and then biotic impacts both to plant communities and then to other organisms. In terms of scoring and categorization, um, this doesn't dictate here is how you shall do it exactly. Different people do it different ways. Some are points-based, um, others are logic-based. Um, and the requirement is simply that it be logical and consistent um, and that it uh, categorize plants based on the level of environmental harm. So it's, it's pretty broad and flexible in that requirement. Um, and in terms of documentation, you need to say why a certain criteria is being scored a certain way and what that rationale is based on, cite your sources. In terms of the process, um, first for planning, you need to select where you're making a list for, which plants you're gonna look at, who is gonna serve on a, on a review committee, what the assessment methodology is that you're going to use to evaluate plants and what your timeline is for the process. And that's the point at which once you have all of that um, specked out, put the information out to the community, both as a heads up, but also so that they can give feedback on, on that. Maybe they think uh, some additional plants should be considered or some additional people should be on the committee. So that's the first place, um, the first public review spot is after you've actually kind of specced out the process. Once, once that review has come through and, and any changes have been made, then it's time to draft assessments. And once you've gotten those drafted and done your internal review with your committee, um, then it's time to put those out for revision, or um, excuse me, for public review. And then if there are any significant revisions, that's where those particular plant assessments would go back out for a second uh, review period. And it is, as Mona mentioned, we posted a response document that addressed all the comments. And we also uh, posted the comments themselves so that people didn't just see our paraphrasing, they saw the, the exact language that the person sent in. Um, so that felt like it was fair to the commenters. So uh, in case we were misinterpreting it all, and um, but it also allowed for the response document to be uh, fairly focused and um, easier to read. And we did put in the response document, if you feel like you've been misrepresented in any way, please contact us. We haven't heard from anybody, but fair way to approach it. So um, I want to talk a little bit about where um, Calypsi is going and a little bit about where National Ipsy is going with this and then open it up for questions. And um, there are, you know, we've kind of skimmed the surface of different things and there's a lot of, um, a lot of in-depth details that are important, but I uh, figured we'd leave that for discussion now and, and later. I think this will be an ongoing discussion as Ipsy's um, work on their lists, but um, feel free to type things into your chat box that you've uh, missed along the way and, and we'll get to those at the end of the call. Um, so Calypsy is going to take, you know, we need to make sure that people can make, uh, make sense of this new watch column. There are folks who uh, on the side of, you know, being concerned about anything being called invasive who's, who want to be careful that we're not calling these plants invasive as well, and, and so do we. We want to distinguish. Um, we want land managers to 
have some guidance as to how they should um, treat these species in terms of their prioritization. Um, in, in terms of how we present the information, like on the website in a table, it's currently sortable and filterable in many different ways, but um, we want to add some new filters and one in particular that will help with the list is, is this plant in horticulture? And we have some references for figuring that out, but we also have a whole community of people, um, horticulturalists who can tell us. Um, so I think that'll be very valuable. Um, we're continuing to work on landscaping guidelines. We're very involved in Plant Right, which is a voluntary program where we work with um, partners from lots of different um, areas, including uh, from the nursery trade, especially from the nursery trade. And so continuing to work on those voluntary guidelines. Um, but then at the same time, because the state is moving forward with some um, updates to their building codes, and including moving water efficient landscaping guidelines into the building codes, um, now's a good time for us to try to figure out what's a reasonable approach to including, excuse me, invasive plant guidelines into, into those building codes where they talk about landscaping. So we'll be continuing to do that. And this list, I think, will will really help us help us do that and and figure out different tiers for depending on how conservative somebody wants to be with their landscaping guidelines. Um, for the National Association of Invasive Plant Councils, I think we we want to um, encourage other groups to use the checklist, the the National IPSI. You're going through an update of your list. And so that involves kind of checking all your criteria just to make sure um, there's not something you're you're missing there that's kind of part of the common set. Um, and then more likely is adjusting your process a little bit so that there there is a formal public review process which um, which adds transparency and credibility to the list. Um, consider including. Uh, a new category of what, whether you call it watch, plant, or something else, where you are using um, a predictive assessment to gauge which of the things that are out there might become a problem in the future. Um, it's That's an additional step, and we actually had funding um, from the Forest Service to pursue um, to pursue those 200, the assessment of those 200 plants. So it's, it's not a trivial matter, um, but it's, one of those things that we had thought about for a long time and then we finally had the funding and were lined up to do it. So put that on the radar screen and think about it sometime in the future. Um, and then to look for opportunities to use uh, use your list of invasive plants in landscaping guidelines. And everybody's doing that already, no doubt. Um, but to look for appropriate ways to get the information out both on a voluntary kind of outreach basis in working with uh, with nursery representatives in your area to to look for um, consensus on plants that are uh, problematic in the trade, and to perhaps get the word out a little more formally about those as we're doing through the plant right uh, process here in California. And then, if there are actually um, you know building codes or other places where um, landscaping guidelines are formalized, which is happening more and more often as green building codes say don't use invasive plants in your landscaping, um, look for appropriate ways to use your lists to support when somebody says well what's invasive um, to support those lists. And I guess I'll say one thing about that is that it's not always as simple as well just don't use anything on our list because our, our lists typically grow out of what a land manager may want to know about in order to uh, manage their land, and that isn't necessarily identical to a list of things that shouldn't be used in landscaping. Um, and with that, I think um, we're done with the formal presentation. Um, there are a couple of, of resources you might want to access, as Mona mentioned. Um, our inventory information is on our website, and I think if you just go to calipsy.org, um, you can find it. But uh, if you want to look specifically for that recent update, um, there is a main panel of our homepage.
Um, and then the checklist, I believe, uh, has been posted on the National IPSI website under resources. Um, so if you're looking for that list um, to compare your process um, as you get set to do an, an update to your IPSI's list, that's where you'll find it. And if you have suggest suggestions, certainly um, let us know. You can let me know and I'm on the executive committee and I can um, pass it on to the other folks working on this. Um, but I think that's uh, that's it for now and I uh, look forward to hearing any of the thoughts or, or questions that any of you have. Okay, so Doug, we've got um, a handful of, handful of uh, questions here um, and I'll just go at them in order that they came in. Um, so the first one was, this is great. Did you look at the EICAT assessment tool? Uh, that's a good question. Um, and I don't know if uh, Nancy Lowenstein's on the phone and if, uh, it's, if it's possible to unmute her, but she may remember. Um, so it'd actually be useful to <laughs> but no, uh, based on the acronym, I don't, I don't recognize it. Um, and we'd certainly be interested in hearing about it. Maybe whoever uh, submitted that can type a little bit more in the chat and tell us what it is. Yeah, um, that, that was uh, Mark Frey. So Mark, if you can give us a little bit more information. Um, okay. The ne and I'll keep on going down the questions. The next one was, um, sorry, um, they missed the first beginning of the presentation. So they were just trying to clarify what the consequences in California of listing a species to farmers, nursery industry, forest industries, landscaper, et cetera. Gotcha. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So um, we're a nonprofit organization and our list is entirely informational. Um, the State Department of Food and Agriculture has a noxious weed list, which is regulatory. So their list informs things like what a nursery can and can't sell um, and what can't be in uh, weed-free forage, um, et cetera. So that, their list is enforced by county agricultural commissioners and there's a whole infrastructure around that. Um, our list is uh, focused entirely on ecological state regulatory list is um, began more as an agricultural list and in later years has begun to consider environmental impacts. But for instance, um, in the code that specifies what can be a noxious weed uh, in California, it says basically anything that's a commodity can't be considered a noxious weed. So if, uh, for instance, if a horticultural plant that's in the trade is, um, is also invasive, we would we would list it as invasive in wildlands, but the state would have a trickier time doing that. Um, that, is, that is shifting over time with some conversations and advocacy, but uh, our, our lists and I think all IPSI lists are don't really have any legal teeth, um, but a lot of the people that work on IPSI lists also work on um, their state lists that do have more legal teeth. So I hope that answers that question. Um, but in terms of implications, not a legal implication, but a utility, um, a landscaper can use our list to say, I don't want to use these plants, or at least the ones that are shown as invasive in my region. Um, a land manager can use it to figure out what they want to control in their land or how bad something might be. Um, an agricultural producer, the, the same thing, it just use it as an informational resource. However, it is, sorry, last, last thing, as we get closer to the green building codes, um, I mentioned uh, landscaping ordinance language, which currently in California says you're discouraged from using any invasive plants, including, it, or such as those listed on the Calypsi list. So that's where things start to run up against each other. Our list is developed as an informational list but there's also a need for that information in those kind of landscaping guidelines. So that that's still evolving. Okay. Um, 
so the the next question haven't heard any discussion on using these assessments and legislation legally restricting the shell importation and movement of plants it's sort of what you were just talking about but where does cal ipsy stand on this issue and what about putting national restrictions on um, importation sale and movement of some of these plants well that that's an interesting question in that um one of the uh best risk assessments um that's out there and that we have based the guidelines the checklist on uh, is the usda aphis assessment protocol and they use that for um, primarily for assessing plants for import that aren't already here and so 237 list um, or the napra not approved pending pest risk assessment list where um, aphis has has done a risk assessment on a particular plant enough to say mm, that looks that looks potentially risky so if somebody wants to import that they're going to have to go through they can't do it until a more detailed pest risk assessment has been done and cleared that plant is safe so that's a that's a beginning of closing the door on something coming in that's that's not safe but um i think uh, you know, different countries have their different perspectives, and Australia is looked on by, I think, uh, weed managers as a great example of a place that really tries to keep things out, and it's uh, looked on probably by someone from the nursery trade as a place that's overly restrictive on on what can be used. So, trying to find the right balance here, um, given the kind of the historical trajectory of the industry and the the government system, I think we're we're moving in the right direction, but it's not something that's gonna that's gonna change fast. And it's a matter of finding the right balance between bringing in safe safe horticultural products that people like and uh, being careful about weeding out the risky ones. And so the next question was about website for the checklist, and that's that's now on the National IPC website. Um, is National Ipsy looking for opportunities to educate landscape training programs um, at university and um, and vocational levels? Hmm. Um, that's a, another great idea. National Ipsy themselves uh, doesn't really have any capacity beyond the individual Ipsys, um, and I'm personally not. Uh, not aware of programs, although I, I feel like Florida or um, some states probably have uh, an effort at outreach to landscapers. Certainly here in California through the Plant Right program, um, there's an effort to get the information out to professionals. Um, and through the like a Bay Friendly landscaping program, there's an effort to uh, train professionals, but um, also people getting into the field if they want to get their bee friendly certification will have to get educated on things, including what's what's a weed and why wouldn't you use it in your landscaping. So I don't know how far that's gotten into universities so far. Um, I think that the predictive tool that we talked about is uh, designed primarily for avoiding risky imports for horticulture. And one of the next steps that, that uh, the plant right group is working off centers across the country and they're um, typically botanic gardens and universities um, that would help do screening for plants so that's one step closer perhaps to the classroom so that people are are learning about this up front and i think we did do a webinar for the ecological landscaping association not long ago and i don't know to what degree they reach into the classroom as well um, for professionals being trained, but I would imagine there's some connection there. So I think it's it's slowly seeping in. So the next question is this listing process similar to what most states use when adding species to their noxious weed list? I would assume so. Um, and if Dean were here, I would ask him. Um, he may be here, but <laughs> not not unmutable. Um, but yeah, I think the the impacts assessment 
and things like reproductive capacity and distribution would be the same. The difference may be that uh, whereas our impacts are, we're looking at ecological impacts, a state noxious weed list would likely look at economic impacts, maybe even as the priority, um, or probably as the priority first. So just recalling the, the federal definition of an invasive species, it's a non-native species that causes economic, environmental harm or harm to human health. Um, so they'd be looking at all of those, whereas we're looking specifically at the ecological impact. So the, the factors looking at impacts, that list would be longer. So next question, are there top things you would do differently if advising another IPSI? In particular, um, any thoughts on different approaches advisable to an IPSI made up of multiple states and therefore likely more stakeholders? Well, um, that raises a couple questions. One is one is the regionality. Um, so our list is for the state of California, but California has got, you know, deserts and rainforests and <laughs> a lot of different habitats. And so that's one of the weaknesses in a statewide list. Um, and so that's the direction we're hoping to head in the future. Two resources allowing um, to enable it to be more regional. So that would be one of the considerations for a multi-state list is to make sure that just ecologically um, the regionality was taken into account. But then in terms of the stakeholders, um, I mean, I, you, you want to have strong representation. And so I guess you'd want to be careful about um, how unwieldy and large a group could get. But for us, it, as Mona said, it was a huge advantage to have a a large group, a large committee to inform the effort. Um, not everybody has a ton of time, so the folks that do and have the expertise can really help with uh, reviewing the assessments, but everybody on that committee represented an important um, stakeholder. And so getting their final approval is important for the, the credibility of the list. Um, so yeah, there definitely, I think there's a, a longer conversation there about recommendations for um, pursuing a list for a multi-state area and um, certainly happy to talk about that more offline. Um, this is I think, kind of a follow-up, but, you know, in, in, or in the same realm, where is National Ipsy on the issue of solving this issue on a national basis? Um, many, not all plants are, are um, truly national issues. Well, um, yes and no. I mean, I think some some are national issues and some are pretty localized. Um, and I think we, national IPSI is, um, again, only got the capacity that the individual IPSIs have. And for the most part, IPSIs are voluntary. So people are doing this in addition to their day job. Um, but there has been progress on the national level on things like the Q37 uh, preventative screening for imports and that's important. I think there are other um, other areas like uh, funding for like local weed management areas that could come federally to complement state and local funding that would be really important and could get a lot done on the ground. Um, Chuck has uh, been very involved in the North American Invasive Species Network which includes Canada and Mexico um, but is a, a national tri-national effort and at the recent conference in Savannah there was some progress made on uh, sharing data especially mapping data distribution data for invasive species and so that on the control end I think is a hopeful direction for um, catching catching things early finding the leading edges finding the outliers at the landscape level and um, and having strategic management. But so at the national level of keeping new plants coming in, um, I think that's, you know, work is being done on that. It's not solved, but there is uh, there is progress on that. Um, but there are so many things that are here already. <laughs> We've already got our hands full with uh, things spreading and the new things that are potentially going to become invasive. So there are a number of different fronts to work on. And so I'd say the simple answer is no, National Ipsy does not have this problem solved <laughs> at the national level. Um, so, and I think this is from a Calypsy perspective, um, 
do you have any paid staff or is your whole council volunteer? So Calypsi does have paid staff. We have um, five, five individuals, about three and a half FTE equivalent. Um, and then we have a strong community. We have a board of directors and a membership of 500 or so and, uh, and a strong community of experts that contributed to this. So there was a ton of in-kind um, effort that went into this this listing process, but there was paid coordination from our staff to make it happen. So that's that's extremely helpful. Um, is the assessment tool you used, and maybe I'm missing, maybe if I misinterpret this, please correct it, but is the assessment tool you use PRE through plant right or modified in some way? Um, it is PRE through plant right, um, which is a, a, a neat system. Um, and as Mona mentioned, it's developed uh, for uh, the horticultural community to um, avoid risky introductions. And so it's a tool that because we are very involved in plant right, they allowed us to use, but it's still in the beta testing phase. And um, they hope to have it available for others in the future, but for now, both because kinks are being worked out and also because um, it's really important to encourage um, adoption by the nursery community. Um, they're taking it slowly with having the, the invasive plant management community dive in there as well. Um. So how many hours of staff time roughly did it take to set up the Calypsy inventory process? What was the average amount of time spent on a single species um, assessment? Hmm. Um, well, in terms of the, the single species assessment, um, I'll pass that to Mona, but for the overall, that's a, that's a tough question, but we did have um, a, a multi-year multi grant um, at $50,000 a year to work on this. And like I say, we had a ton of in-kind um, contributed by Calypsi members. And that so that was mostly, we had 10, 10 new plants to our inventory and then reviewed 20 plants with the predictive assessment. Um, we do plan to continue updating on an annual basis, not at that scale. And uh, the cost in dollars and time is definitely something we'll be paying attention to. But um, Mona, I know on the, at least on the, predictive assessment forms, there's a, a field for how many hours was spent on it, if I'm not mistaken. Do you have a sense for how, how long, how many hours total goes into a PATH or a, a predictive assessment? Uh, sure, sure. So um, as, as with many invasive plants, you probably all know that some of them we have a lot of information on, like yellow star thistle Doug mentioned, or in some of them we have barely anything. Uh, because maybe nobody studied it before. So for the predict predictive assessment tool, um, uh, if we're starting a new species, it would take between uh, two to four hours to fill one out. Um, and then we also have yet another committee on the predictive assessments that reviewed everything and uh, would create issues if, they need if we needed to change anything and then we would have to fix those um, in order for that to be finalized. So uh, six to eight hours per species for the total um, effort, and that would be for the person preparing it uh, plus the committee. Then for our Kelepsy uh, plan assessment forms, those were a lot more detailed. That took more time. So I would say, you know, perhaps preparing one of those eight to ten hours to get all the information together and then we had several rounds of committee review. So um, perhaps, you know, 15 to 20 hours total per species, uh, but that includes all the committee time too. That's all I had, Doug, go ahead. I think it's back okay. to me. Um, so how does this assessment differ from, I guess, an EDRR assessment? And do you only, 
do you only have one category of invasives? I guess is is what that question is. Um, well, so for EDRR, we're we're often looking at. Um, I mean, yes, it's very similar, but we're also looking at uh, spatial information. So um, it's unusual that there is a brand new plant species that we know about that's very limited. Um, so you usually eradication in a region that we're after. So something may be too widespread to control in one area, but you know, we can contain it. But in another region, it could be eradicated. Um, so we would be looking at this evaluation. How does the plant rate, but also at the spatial distribution? And that's where that Cal Weed Mapper tool comes in. And Mark clarified on that assessment, it was the environmental impact classification of alien taxa that was a tool developed in Europe in 2014, and that has been adopted by the IUCN as a standard assessment tool. That, yeah, that rings a bell. I don't know that we, um, actually, I do think that we looked through that as a committee. It wasn't part of our initial um, set of, of criteria systems, because I came out after that, but because we did start this a long time ago. Um, but we looked through the, I'm remembering a, a journal article where it was laid out and we went through and, and matched things up. But I think um, that is a really promising effort and making sure that we're synced up with that is, is really important. As I remember, oh. I and others can talk about this later, but um, yeah, we, you know, we saw good overlap and, and no red flags. And I'm, Trying to pick and choose. We've got a lot of questions. Um, you mentioned a horticultural component will hopefully be included in the assessment in the future. Can you flesh out some ideas of the risk assessment questions that will be addressed, that will address plants and cultivation? Yeah, so actually I wasn't, wasn't saying that um, there would be horticultural information considered in the assessment, um, more just that when the plants are shown in a table that there would be a, a checkbox whether or not it is in horticulture so that if you wanted to take a look at our list and only see the plants that are found in horticulture, you could, you could filter that way. So if I wanted to say I'm in um, southern coastal California and I want to know what are the weeds that are actually horticultural plants in my region, you could do all that filtering. Because as it as it stands now, you'd get a bunch of plants that, you know, like yellow star thistle that you're not gonna be considering as a horticultural part of your landscaping. Um, so you'd like to filter that out. I'm, I'm wondering if there's something you can say about green building codes in re regard to invasive plants. What building code organization are attentive to this? And most of building is regulated at the munici municipal level, right? The, do you know of state efforts to regulate invasive plants and new developments? Yeah, that's an interesting one, and it's a field I'm only slightly familiar with, but there's everything from the International Green Construction Code, um, and um, I think it's ASHRAE something, 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 that, that exist out there as model codes, and then they're adopted yeah, at state levels, at local municipal levels. And so what we've been working on most recently is there, there's a process um, in California for updating the state's green building code. And my understanding is that municipality, there's a certain part of that that is mandated um, for municipalities to adopt, but then they can adopt additional parts of it that are um, perhaps elective and above and beyond. Um, so we're looking to make sure that these uh, planting elements are in there as well. I have, <laughs> my colleague is, is uh, motioning to me that our, tr our train is getting dangerously close. <laughs> So uh, probably about three three more minutes is uh, is would be. Chuck, was this planned for an hour, an hour and a half? Yeah, I yeah. love all the questions. I think, uh, yeah, I think we were just an hour, and yeah, we're over. Okay. Up. If there's any more, um, 
Um, a day on this. <laughs> yeah. Um, how did you advertise the public comment period? Ah, good, good question. So we put it out. Uh, you know, we, we posted everything on our website, and then we emailed everyone we could think of. I mean, all our normal network of folks. But then, because we work with Plant Right, we have lots of um, contacts with the nursery trade and with the nursery trade associations through that. So we made sure to send them uh, direct emails and say, hey, this is <laughs> this is a, a good opportunity. We'd love to have input from your folks. So that was basically it, putting, putting all the information on our website and then sending emails uh, to everyone we could think of and asking them to pass it along. Um, how many people worked on the initial assessments before going to the subcommittee for review and how long did the typical assessment take? I think you may have covered some of that, but. Yeah, I could pass that back to Mona, but, but I think the assessments were typically done by one person, and then there'd be a small committee of folks that would re review that to say, yep, that all looks good and consistent with the way I did it, because they were often, often the subcommittees were um, made up of other people who were also drafting their, uh, their own assessments. And yeah, I think Mona addressed the time time question on that. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. We had an initial, uh, someone would draft them up and then committee uh, revisions. So in both both cases of our, our predictive assessment and um, in our plan assessment form, uh, we had one person start with the drafting. So, and we could end with this question. For a plant like Alanthus, can we create a national repository of assessments that we can all share? Um, oh, that's a, yeah, it's a great idea. I think because all these assessments are going to have virtually the same questions, the scoring systems might be different, but you want to, you want to have the same information to cite. And yes, there's the published literature, but then there's all of the professional knowledge that you could draw on too. I think it's a great idea to have a, um, a national repository for, for assessments so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Yeah, and I'm not sure necessarily that National Ipsy could, could host that, which is the second part of that question. Um, but um, just because National Ipsy is, is strictly volunteer, um, except for, you know, the, at the national level volunteer anyway. And so, but, I, you know, I think maybe it's something that, um, as these are built, you know, more organizations could help, help make that happen, I guess. Is, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and certainly, you know, we've had some luck getting funding for assessment. And so there may be a funder out there who would be interested in helping to, um, make that a reality. So it's that's a great idea, and it's good to put it on the radar screen so we can aim towards it. And I think that goes to the time and dollars question very much, because uh, if everybody's looking up their own information, that takes a lot longer than if you can see what's already been collected. Um, and I'll, I'll throw this one in because I know you want to answer it. Is In your assessment protocol, what is the baseline requirement for suitable um, geospatial data. Um, is point data, presence, absence, accepts, acceptable to an assessment or verifiable acreage and density required? <laughs> <laughs> oh my. Um, well, you know, the distribution questions on the assessment are um, pretty, pretty broad and don't um, get down to a lot of fine details. So that, that question is definitely relevant when it comes down to to mapping and setting strategy at the on the ground um, and at the landscape level, but in terms of our assessments, just knowing what's out there and how much of it there is, um, that's a little fine grained. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. Um, and Doug's email is on the screen, so if you have additional questions or I didn't get to your question, um, then I'm sure he will be glad to take them. And um, we're going to save this, and, and it'll be posted on the uh, um, National Ipsy website um, by sometime next week at the latest. So, Excellent. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all the questions and dialogue. Thanks, Chuck. No problem.